Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Ewart. It's Friday, January 20th. This is Africa 54. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen kicked off her 10-day trip to Africa and Senegal with hopes for greater economic partnerships. Also, China's new foreign minister wrapped up his first tour to the continent this week, with analysts saying Beijing is playing down its power struggle with the West. And in this week's entertainment segment, Music Times' Heather Maxwell has her eye on Kenyan singer and songwriter Sarah Nay as the up-and-coming artist to watch in 2023. All this and more on today's Africa 54. We begin our broadcast in East Africa, where Al-Shabaab terrorists killed at least seven Somali soldiers on Friday after storming a military base in Kalgad using car bombs and weapons fire, according to the Somali Information Ministry and Al-Shabaab. An officer at the base says the attack was eventually repelled, but the dead included the base's deputy commander, who was part of a U.S.-trained unit stationed there. The attack underscores the formidable threat Al-Shabaab poses for Somalia's military. Meanwhile, a Kenyan government official says its security forces killed 10 Al-Shabaab fighters in eastern Kenya, recovering rocket-propelled grenades and improvised explosive devices in Garissa County. In Burkina Faso, security sources say two suspected jihadist attacks have killed at least 18 people, including 16 auxiliaries supporting the army. Thursday's attacks in the north and northwest of the country were the latest to hit a civilian auxiliary force that supports the military in a seven-year fight against jihadists. The first attack targeted an advanced party of volunteers for the defense of the fatherland, and the second attack occurred when a convoy escorted by auxiliaries and soldiers was ambushed on the Siena Saran Road. Nigerian authorities say armed men on Thursday night attacked a village in north-central Benue state, killing at least eight people, beheading some of them. A Benue state security advisor told VOA affiliate and Los, Los Lagos-based channels television the attack happened around 9 p.m. local time in the town of Makurdi, just opposite the Abagana camp for internally displaced people. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has begun her three-nation 10-day trip to Africa Friday in Senegal. For more on the significance of her visit to Senegal and her engagements there, here's Khalil Gay in Dakar. Yes, this Africa trip of the United States Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, marks an essential step in the U.S.-Africa relationship and the Biden administration's new cooperation policy. And Senegal is very privileged to be part of the selected few countries to be visited by Treasury Secretary Yellen. Indeed, the government is successfully implementing substantial economic reforms. Several infrastructure projects and the start of oil and gas production starting this year forecast a robust economic period beginning this year, bringing about real GDP. In a bilateral meeting this morning with Senegalese Minister of Economy, Planning and Cooperation, William Matassar, Secretary Yellen declared that the United States highly values its bilateral relationship with Senegal, an important partner of the United States. Minister Uli Matassar stressed some 60 years of excellent cooperation between the USA and Senegal. She said that the USA strongly supports Senegal in several sectors such as education, health, agriculture, and mining, to name a few. Minister Saar also disclosed that some 50 American companies are active in Senegal. 
Following her meeting with Minister Saar, Ms. Yellen visited the General Delegation for Rapid Entrepreneurship of Women and Youth, a flagship Senegalese initiative advancing economic empowerment. U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, will meet with President Macky Sall today, and she will visit the island of Gore tomorrow before traveling to the city of Chess, 70 kilometers from the capital, Dakar, for the launching of the supply, transport, construction of lines, and electrification of communities in the framework of universal access to electricity project. In Fanden, Daibanjai, in the region of Chess. That was Halil Gai in Senegal reporting for us. Russia's war against Ukraine is hitting Africans particularly hard by exacerbating food insecurity and dragging down the continent's economy. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen had more to say Friday on the effects of the war in Ukraine and Africa. Russia's barbaric aggression against its neighbor is particularly being felt by Africa and its people. Russia's war and weaponization of food has exacerbated food insecurity and caused untold suffering. And the global economic headwinds caused by the actions of a single man, President Putin, is creating an unnecessary drag on Africa's economy. The United States is partnering with African leaders to mitigate the damage caused by Russia. Last year, we committed around $13 billion in emergency aid and food assistance, and we worked to unlock Ukrainian food exports in the Black Sea Grain Initiative, including those headed to Africa. Secretary Yellen says U.S. investments prioritized rigorous technical standards, had high standards for accountability and transparency, and also carefully considered risk to the longer-term sustainability of a country's debts. China's new foreign minister has wrapped up his first tour of Africa. Ken Gang visited five countries and stressed that China does not see the continent as the arena for a new power struggle between the West and Beijing. Kate Bartlett reports from Johannesburg. For more than three decades, it's been tradition that the top Chinese diplomat's first foreign trip is to Africa. New Foreign Minister Chin Gang did just that. Beijing, in recent years, has invested heavily in infrastructure projects on the continent through its Belt and Road Initiative. Some analysts say the U.S. is now playing catch-up with China in its dealings with Africa. In December, U.S. President Joe Biden hosted a summit of African leaders in Washington. China does not see itself in competition with the U.S. in Africa, said Chin while visiting Ethiopia. Here's Chin on Chinese state television. What Africa needs is solidarity and cooperation, not block confrontation. No personal country has the right to force African countries or African people to take sides. While in Ethiopia, Chin inaugurated the new $80 million Africa Center for Disease Control, built as China's gift. The opening of the Africa CDC was a diplomatic win for China, says Paul Natulia of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Chin Gang's uh, visit uh, sought to um, send across uh, certain strategic messages. Uh, the first being that the relationship between China and Africa is stable, it's multifaceted, and it's, uh, and it's well anchored. Chin had reportedly agreed to forgive an undisclosed amount of Ethiopia's debt and pledged aid for reconstruction in the northern region of Tigray following the end of a two-year civil war. The chairman of the African Union Commission urged China to support the regional body in its quest for a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. The African continent, with 1.3 billion inhabitants and 54 member states, has the right to be a member of this international governance and a permanent member of the Security Council. From Ethiopia, Chin traveled to Benin and Gabon, which analysts say was in keeping with China's goal of expanding the Belt and Road Initiative into Francophone West Africa. He stopped in Angola, a key security partner, and then traveled to Egypt, strategically important to China because of its numerous investments there, including in the new administrative capital being built outside Cairo and the Suez Canal. 
Chin held meetings not only with Egyptian government officials, but with the Arab League, expressing his desire for an end to the Israel-Palestinian conflict. Analysts say Chin may be a different kind of foreign minister than his predecessors. When he was an ambassador to the US, he was known for, you know, being somewhat strident in some of his statements. Maybe he's come away from the US with his own perspective from from engaging in, in those policy circles. So maybe he has some quite different angles and views on global diplomacy just based even on that. As Chin departed Africa, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen arrived for a three-nation visit to the continent, signaling the importance of Africa in geopolitics. Kate Bartlett for VOA News, Johannesburg. Power brokers have wrapped up the World Economic Forum's annual conclave in Davos, Switzerland, as worries about the war in Ukraine, a warming planet and a cooling global economy dominated the discussions. Climate activist Greta Thunberg and around 30 other activists braved sub-zero temperatures Friday to stage a protest calling for climate justice. The protesters chanted they want climate justice and they want it now. Thunberg held up a sign saying keep it in the ground. She was detained by police in Germany earlier this week during a demonstration against the expansion of a coal mine. The oil and gas industry, which has been accused by activists of hijacking the climate change debate says that it needs to be part of the energy transition as fossil fuels continue to play a major role in the energy mix as the world shifts to a low carbon economy. The World Economic Forum is wrapping up in Switzerland Friday and uh, representatives at the forum sought partnerships with other nations to digitize, build infrastructure and create job opportunities on the continent. I'm joined live now via Skype from Davos by Boaz Blacky K. Zire. He's the head of policy and advocacy at the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. Boaz, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you for having me. Tell us how the forum addressed the food crisis in Africa that we're witnessing and we haven't seen in recent years. I think the forum 2023 has been a very phenomenal gathering. More importantly, because the forum is coming at a time when the continent and the global world is emerging from three big crises. One is the challenges that have been associated with the Russia-Ukraine crisis, and more importantly, the difficulties and challenges that have been inflicted on Africa's agriculture. Secondly, the forum is coming at a time when we're just emerging out of the COVID-19 crisis and all the disruptions that may have been created. But more importantly, the forum is coming at a time where the world is actually challenged by climate change and climate um, disruptions in the way we grow our, our food. So partners are actually are discussing very several issues here. They are really trying to find solutions on the extent to which we can actually mitigate climate change challenges. For Africa, we have one big issue. One is to make sure that the African smallholder farmers are able to adapt climate change because they cannot mitigate because they are not contributing to the climate change itself. But there is a very, very good discussion that I imagine in terms of how do we push the Western countries to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, at the same time making sure that they are increasing financing for Africa's agriculture. So there is a lot of discussion that are happening in Davos, and I'm glad that, uh, that, that these discussions are yielding results. And as you return to the continent of Africa, Africans are waiting to hear what the representatives for the continent are going to be taking back there. And what are the key issues that you put on the table and perhaps the solutions that you're going to be offering when you return? I think so from the food systems perspective, uh, there are quite a number of issues that we need Africans to listen to, but also the African representatives to be able to show and put on the table. The first key important part is that, in my view, Africa wasn't sufficiently represented at the highest level. I'm glad to announce that the president of Tanzania, I think he's the one who was in Davos, uh, but there are other voices on the, on the, from the continent that have joined different discussions. So th there are major issues. One is climate change. And we are thinking of new solutions on how do we make sure that we are adapting climate change. Issues related to regenerative agriculture, for example, making sure that Farmers are able to increase production and productivity of agriculture without disrupting the environment, without encroaching on wetlands, without cutting forests. Two, 
the whole issues around increasing financing to the very critical issues that affect agriculture and food systems in Africa. But lastly, and more importantly, is the markets. One of the biggest issues that farmers respond to is if they are functional markets, they will be able to adapt to new technologies. They will be able to buy the right seeds. They'll be able to access the right fertilizer. They'll be able to actually get the right extension to be able to increase production. So the market is a very big incentive. And that's why the representatives in Davos are speaking to the big market leaders. You know, those who are actually into the space and making sure that you don't actually create the African market, but also making sure that agriculture products are able to access both the European, the American, and other parts of the world markets. Uh, and uh, right. the Africa continental free trade area has been also be able to discuss some of those issues. And we are glad this is happening uh, here in Davos. Boaz, uh, tell us about uh, the big talk about digital revolution in Africa and what your, your vision is to digitize the continent and how that will be effective in creating jobs, especially for the youth in Africa. I think this is one of the major revolutions that is happening on the continent. I'm so glad that the African and the African constituency, especially the youth, are jumping onto this bandwagon. Uh, this has been one of the major topics here in Davos, to make sure that we take advantage of the digitization of different aspects of agriculture value chains and also in the non-agriculture economic uh, spaces. One of the key areas that I think Africa needs to pay attention to is to increase the kind of infrastructure that will absorb and be able to accommodate the digitization revolution. And I am so glad that most of the investing community are also looking at Africa as a very potential area where they can go to. So digitization is very critical. Creating jobs is going to be at the center of every Africa leader's uh, discussions. And we're going to be encouraging and working with countries to put in place the right policy regulatory environment for increasing digitization to be able to create jobs in different sectors of the economy. Boas, thank you so much for your perspective. Thank you for having me. Boas Blackie K. Zire is the head of policy and advocacy at the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and all our VOA Africa programs on our website at voaafrica.com. Still to come, Music Time in Africa host Heather Maxwell presents Kenyan singer and songwriter Seroni. We'll be right back. Pregnancy is a global issue with multiple health concerns and social and economic consequences. Although the worldwide adolescent birth rate is decreasing, Sub-Saharan Africa continues to have twice the global average. This week on Our Voices, we will look at the contributing factors for Africa's high adolescent birth rates. We will also hear from teen mothers and experts on steps that need to be taken to increase girls' awareness of their sexual and reproductive health. Join the conversation each week right here on Our Voices. In other news, police say a Rwandan journalist, John Williams Ntwali, who produced content that was critical of the government, has been killed in a road crash. Ntwali, 44, editor of the Chronicles newspaper, was killed when a speeding vehicle rammed a motorcycle on which he was a passenger. The chairperson of the South Sudanese body monitoring the country's implementation of the 2018 peace deal is urging the Joint Defense Board to deploy troops who graduated in August. Lieutenant General Asrat Denero Ahmad says more than 50,000 unified forces have graduated from various military sites across South Sudan. And the UN says mass graves containing 49 bodies have been discovered in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. The UN attributes the killings to an ethnic militia group. 42 bodies, including 12 women and six children, were found buried in the village of Nyamamba, and seven male bodies were found in the village of Mbogi. 
U.S. President Joe Biden repeated his warnings about climate change and pledged federal assistance to the western state of California in the wake of a string of storms and flooding. But his critics say he's not doing enough, and those who praise his climate policies and legislation say change won't come overnight. Viewers Anita Powell reports from Washington. Stormy gray skies over the Golden State. The latest example of extreme weather that President Joe Biden says is caused by climate change. Extreme weather caused by climate change means stronger and more frequent storms. Biden visited California Thursday to assess the damage caused by recent storms, to promise federal help, and to deliver a message. We have to invest in stronger infrastructure to lessen the impacts of these disasters because they become cumulative in a sense. We've already allocated funding from the infrastructure law that I signed a year ago. Biden says he's made other strides in fighting climate change with the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act, which directs nearly $400 billion in federal funding to clean energy. In a bid to meet the U.S. commitment under the Paris Agreement, which aims to curb global warming to less than 2 degrees Celsius. And he's promoted U.S. innovation in clean energy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which scientists say drive climate change. Sherry Goodman of the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program said the U.S. government has long seen climate change as a threat. We have to understand it in terms of these compound and cascading risks, because one risk, wildfire-fueled storms, then has an impact on the next set of climate events, these extreme, these atmospheric rivers, and they all interact. The burden, she said, should be shared by the government and the private sector. A message also delivered to global power players at the World Economic Forum. Biden sent his top climate envoy, John Kerry, to this week's meeting in Davos, Switzerland. John Scott, head of sustainability risk at Zurich Insurance Group, says separate groups must work together to fight climate change. Solving climate change is kind of like the ultimate team sport. It, it isn't just coming from one sector. So it has to be governments, it has to be business, it has to be the finance sector working together to, to really address these, these really complex and systemic issues. And Goodman said, change will take time. You know, we can't just go cold turkey on fossil fuels. We're going to be using oil and gas for some time still. But critics say leaders should be more aggressive, especially when it comes to confronting polluting industries. We cannot fix this problem without strong government action. And that needs to start by confronting the fossil fuel companies that are at the heart of the problem and have um, sought to distract, deny, and delay for so long. And some of Biden's political opponents, even some fellow Democrats, have blunted more sweeping legislation, arguing that those industries create valuable jobs. So is Biden doing too much or not enough? Time and temperatures will tell. I need a Powell view of news, Washington. It's time for Entertainment Report, and joining us now is Heather Maxwell, host of VOS Music Time in Africa radio program. Hello, Heather. Hi, Esther. You know, we all look forward to our favorite artists making great music and performing concert tours, but breakout stars are thrilling. I met one such artist earlier this week virtually. Check him out. Rene, how are you doing? I'm pretty good. Thank you so much. How are you doing? I'm fine. It's nice to meet you. I've heard a lot about you. It sounds like you have an exploding career right now. Tell me about what's happening. You've been signed to Universal. Yeah, um, uh, Universal Music Kenya just launched in East Africa, Kenya. And uh, I'm among the few artists who are under the roster. And uh, I'm pretty excited to present African music, especially from the East Africa to the world. And uh, we just dropped a debut album, I'm a Star. And uh, we're excited to, you know, represent Swahili culture mixed up with R&B and dance also. Uh, I like your new video that's out. Is There's a lot of wiggling going on in Wiggle. For us, uh, wiggling is an African expression, you know. So wiggle is just to show that you're free on the dance floor. You're free to do what you want. And wiggling is one of the few ways that uh, over the years we've seen uh, 
especially the females, you know, like in the dance floor, just wiggling, you know. So Wiggle is just that ultimate party song to get the ladies dancing, to get the, the, the party goers crazy. So the video is doing well. Check it out on YouTube. And I'm pretty excited about that. So tell me, how long have you been in music and I know that you studied law so what is the draw to music as opposed to law? Well for me I started music uh, at a young age I officially dropped my first single in 2015 but as a man I was going through a journey I was going through an awakening so I figured out how do I combine the two how do I combine music and my legal uh, background and uh, we decided to have a foundation, which is New Africa Pomoja Foundation, which is uh, an acronym for Now Uniting Africa Together. It's an organization empowering Africa through performing arts, sports, fashion, music, film, photography, and governance, uh, governance and leadership. And music is one of the craziest things that can unite people. And uh, that's the combination between my legal as an artist i'm free to make music and i'm also uh an activist in terms of youth empowerment in terms of freedom of artistic choice and that's what i believe in i do notice that you know you do tend to do light topics mostly fun uh women good time do you also address other issues like more social issues in your music or do you like to stick to just good time bring people together with a party kind of vibe i don't want people to listen to my music and have too much to think about i just want them to enjoy the vibration that comes along and i feel like even in heaven we're gonna have a crazy party so i like to put that through and i have other ways that i can address uh social issues I have a foundation, New Africa Promoter. We have different programs that we address social issues through our programs. And through that, I feel that is more effective. Saroni, thank, thank you so much for your time and best of luck to you in 2023. Thank you so much. All right, so that's Serone. In the coming weeks, I'll bring you more Artist on the Rise spotlights from across Africa. But for now, back to you, Esther. Thank you so much, Heather. That was wonderful. Be sure to join Heather Maxwell's Entertainment Reports every Friday right here on Africa 54. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a great weekend. Come on over.